Hey everyone, it's, it's great to be back and to be part of this uh, celebration. So um, let me start with a, uh, uh, let me use this mic instead. And let me start with a very simple question. Where does knowledge come from? Until recently it came from just three sources. Evolution, that's the knowledge that's encoded in your DNA. Experience, that's the knowledge that's encoded in your neurons. And culture, the knowledge that we acquire by talking with other people, reading books, and so on. Now what's remarkable is that in just the last you know, several years, the last couple of decades, a new source of knowledge has emerged from the planet. And that's computers. And notice that you know, these, uh, these different sources of knowledge are what, you know, are what make us who we are and, 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 and as successful as we are. And, and uh, notice also that each of these ways of discovering knowledge works orders of magnitude faster than the previous ones and discovers orders of magnitude more knowledge. And computers are going to be no exception. In fact, the other company, the machine learning researcher, who's now the director of AI research at Facebook, says that most of the knowledge in the world in the future is going to be extracted by machines and will reside in machines. So this is a really huge change that I think we all need to be aware of and, and you know, and at least the way that we all need to write, not just you know computer scientists, but, but everybody else as well, which is part of why I the book. So, so how do computers discover new knowledge? Well, that's exactly what machine learning is all about. And what I'd like to do here is give you maybe a slightly different view of machine learning than maybe the one that you, know, that, that you are uh, used to. There's really five major ways of discovering new knowledge, which correspond to the five tribes uh, of machine learning. The first one is to fill in gaps in your existing knowledge, a little bit like scientists at work, using the scientific method of generating hypotheses, testing them, and finding them, and so on. Another one, very popular these days, under the name of deep learning, is to emulate the brain. And then there's simulating evolution, right? You can also discover and develop a lot of things that way. And then there's uh, realizing that all knowledge that comes from data is necessarily uncertain, and so maybe what we want to do is quantify that uncertainty and systematically reduce it. And then finally, there's reasoning by analogy, something that human beings do, you know, continuously. When faced with a new situation, you try to see similarities between that situation and, and ones that you've been in before, and then it's a way from one to the other. And, and as I said, associated with each of these ways of discovering knowledge, there's a whole paradigm, a whole school of thought in machine learning. And one of the things that makes machine learning not just very important is this, but also very fun, is that each of these has its roots in a different field of knowledge. So under the guise of studying machine learning, you actually get to study all of these different things. And each tribe also has its own master algorithm. A master algorithm is like a master key that opens all locks. It's a single learning algorithm that can be proven, you know, there's theorems for each one of them, that is able to discover any knowledge given enough data. So for example, the first five we need are the symbolists, they have their origins in logic and philosophy, and their master algorithm is, is inverse deduction. And one of the pioneering centers of, of research in symbolic machine learning that is and was UCI. When I came here, UCI was one of the, you know, maybe top two or three places in, in symbolic machine learning. And also in combining it with other things, which is actually what my PhD was in, which, you know, has, has led to, to this. Then the connection is, these are the people who want to reverse engineer the brain. Obviously, they're inspired by new science. And then NASA algorithm is, is back propagation which you probably have in your pocket right now in your cell phone doing things like speech recognition and uh, you know, correcting your typos and, and, and many other things. The evolutionaries are the people who are inspired by evolutionary biology and the NASA algorithm is genetic programming. The patients, of course, have their roots in statistics, and their NASA algorithm is probably good. And then finally, the analogizers, they actually have their roots in many different fields, but probably the single most important one is, is psychology. And the best known algorithm of this class is what I call kernel machines or, or support vector machines. So let's let's start with the symbols. And I got some famous ones, Kamucho, Steve Monica, and Mark Kerman, who's on my committee. 
The basic idea behind symbolic learning is actually a really brilliant insight, and it's the following. Deduction, we all know how to do. It's going from general rules to specific facts. In fact, you could say that's all that computers, all that machines do is automated deduction. Machine learning is induction. It's the opposite. It's going from specific facts to general rules, and that is very hard. And for a long time, people had no idea how to do that. But if you look at the history of mathematics, there's this long history of people figuring out how to do something by virtually being the inverse of something that they already knew how to do very well. Like, for example, subtraction is the inverse of addition, or integration is the inverse of differentiation. And in the same way, induction can be viewed and solved as the inverse of deduction. So, for example, addition lets you answer questions like, if I add 2 and 2, what do I get? The answer being 4, that's not the deepest thing we'll hear today. Subtraction lets you answer the inverse question, which is, what do I need to add to 2 in order to get 4? And the answer, of course, is 2. Now, by analogy with that, deduction lets you answer questions like, if something... If I know that Socrates is human and that humans are mortal, what can I infer from that? Well, I can infer that Socrates is mortal. Now, the inverse question of that is, if I know that Socrates is human, what else do I need to know in order to infer that he's mortal? Well, I need to know that humans are mortal. And I've just induced a new rule that I can now add to my knowledge base and combine with other rules to answer really very of questions potentially very different from anything that I have in the day. So this ability to learn composable pieces of knowledge is something that only the symbolists can do. Now, of course, this is all in natural language, and computers don't understand natural language. In reality, they do this in a formal language like first order logic, but, but the idea is basically this. Is. And I said that this is a little bit like scientists at work, right? You formulate hypotheses, and then you test them, and so on. Uh, and you find the hypothesis by looking at data. And, and indeed, one of the most uh, exciting applications of symbolic knowledge is precisely to automate science. So, for example, the biologist in this picture is not the guy in the lab coat. The guy in the lab coat is actually a machine learning researcher by the name of Ross King. The biologist in this picture is actually this machine in the background. And what this machine does is it uses it, so it starts out with knowledge, you know, basic knowledge of molecular biology, DNA, proteins, and so on. And then it's given, for example, a model organism to study or a problem to solve. And then it formulates hypotheses using an inverse deduction to explain the data that it has. And then it actually designs and carries out all by itself the experiments to test those hypotheses. That's what this thing is. It's, it's a, you know, a gene sequencer, microarrays, etc., etc. And then it refines the hypothesis and keeps going at it until it's satisfied. Now this machine here is called Eve. Mm -hmm. There was a previous one called Adam. And a couple of years ago, Eve discovered the new malaria drug. And if you think about it, once you have a robust scientist like this, there's nothing keeping you from making a million. And now science can progress correspondingly faster. Now the connection is, uh, they look at this and go, well, sure, that's fine. But most learning does not happen that way. Most learning is not scientists in lab coats or mathematicians doing proofs. Most learning is human beings, you know, living their life, you know, slipping on banana skins and who knows what else. The leader of the connection is, is Jeff Nicken. He started out as a psychologist. He's basically a professor of computer science in Toronto. He really believes that the way the brain learns, your brain and mine, can be captured in a single algorithm. And he's been trying to discover that algorithm for the last 40 years. In fact, he tells the story of coming home from work one day uh, to his family saying, yes, I did it. I figured out how the brain works. And his daughter looked, looked at him and said, oh, dad, not again. <laughs> so, you know, it's his, you know, his quest has had its ups and downs, but he was one of the inventors of that thought. So, you know, he hasn't discovered how the brain learns yet, but this is already having a huge impact. To other famous connections, Sian Lukao, where we met, and Yasha Benjo. These are the three founders usually considered of deep learning. So what's the idea here? The idea is that we're going to reverse engineer the brain. 
Right? Everything you know, everything you've ever learned is encoded in your synapses. And we know roughly how that works. In fact, some of the people who pioneered that, like Gary Lynch, are right here at UCI. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a model of how a neuron works, and then we're going to connect that up in a huge network of neurons, because that's what the brain is, and then we're going to try to make it learn in a similar way to how a real neuron works. So how does a neuron work? Well, a neuron is a really, really strange kind of cell. It's unlike any other in the human body. It's a cell that looks like a microscopic tree. It has a tree trunk called the axon, and it fires electric impulses down that axon. And then it goes off into the branches that are called dendrites, and the branches of one tree connect with the roots of other trees. So it's the most tangled jungle. Your brain is the most tangled jungle that you've ever seen. Okay? And now the key point is that the efficiency of those connections between dendrites, called synapses, is variable. When two neurons fire together, the synapse tends to get stronger. And this, to the best of our knowledge, is how all, everything you know is encoded. It's in the strength of the connections, hence the name connection. So here's a simple model of this, and like, you know, like Pierre mentioned, it was uh, uh, McCulloch and Kitts who invented this back in the 40s. This is the simplest possible model of the neuron that will work. Here you have a bunch of inputs, they could be other neurons, or they could be you know, pixels in, in the retina. Each one of them is multiplied by the weight that, that represents the strength of the corresponding synapse, and that's all the charge coming in. Right? If that charge exceeds a certain threshold, then the neuron fires, meaning it's at value 1. Otherwise, it doesn't fire, meaning it's at value 0. So, for example, if you're seeing a cat here, and the neuron is looking properly, the output should be 1. Okay. Now, training a single neuron to recognize simple things is easy, you know, when you had this in the 50s. The really hard problem is what happens when you have a huge network of neurons. And then, you know, here's a little neuron in the middle of that network, and it sweats from other neurons, and, you know, this thing should be firing because there's a cat that thinks it, but it's not firing. Now, what do you do? This is often called the credit assignment problem machine learning. Really a key problem. Maybe it should be called the blame assignment problem because it's figuring out who to blame when things go wrong. Right? How is this weight to blame for the output being zero when it should be one? Well, this is actually the problem that that propagation solves. That Jeff and, 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 and Normal Hart and Lewis uh, you know, figured out back in the 80s. And by the way, one. Steve Hansen, who was a postdoc of my advisor, Dennis Kibler, he actually invented that in parallel, never got credited for it. Because he submitted a paper to Ichikai and it was rejected. Ichikai did the main you know, conference in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in AI. So how does backprop work? Very simple idea. What I'm going to do is I'm going to wiggle each one of those weights. I'm going to increase it a little bit, I'm going to decrease it a little bit. If when I increase this weight a little bit, the error at the output goes down, for example, the output goes from point 0.1 to point 0.2, it's getting closer to 1. And therefore, that's a change that I want to make. At heart, this is all that backdrop is doing. Now, of course, if you were to do that the way I just described, it would be hopelessly inefficient. The clever idea in backdrop is that we're actually going to do this by propagating errors from the output back to the input, and hence the name. We're going to see how much each of these weights, just using you know, calculus, is responsible for the error. And then based on that, how much the weights in the previous layer are responsible and so forth. And this is really all that back propagation is doing. And as I mentioned, these days back propagation is used for just about everything. It's used to recognize speech. It's used to do you know, simultaneous translation. You can talk on Skype with someone where you speak English. They hear Chinese in your voice. And then they speak, and you hear them speaking in their voice in English for example. And you can do image recognition, you know, like the big search engines, ad placement, you know, et cetera, et cetera. These are all powered, essentially, by this algorithm. But probably the most famous example is still the one that um, was on the front page of the New York Times a few years ago. Never did I imagine when I was a grad student here that one day machine learning algorithms would be on the front page of the New York Times, but now they are. And, you know, the, the journalists call this the Google Cat Network. It recognized that it was trained by, by watching many, many hours of YouTube video. In fact, maybe it should have been called the Couch Potato Network because that's what it did, was you know, watch TV. 
The Germans call it the rubble cat flower because cats were the single thing that it was best able to recognize, but it can recognize dogs and people and so on. The reason, by the way, it could recognize cats better than anything else is that, I don't know if you know, if you notice, but like, people love to upload videos of their cats. So there's more training examples of cats on YouTube than anything else. But as I said, you know, this network, you know, can recognize lots of things. And at the time was the biggest uh, neural network ever built. You had, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of connections. Now there's, there's networks with billions. But the human brain, you know, has several orders of magnitude more than that, so, so we still have a ways to go. Now the evolutionaries look at this and they say, well sure, tweaking the weights on your connection is very nice, but where did that brain that's learning come from? Right? In deep learning, we actually have to design the architecture and then that prop will change the weights to learn. But where, did, where does the architecture come from? Well, the architecture of the brain, of, of our brain, was created by evolution, as, you know, just like everything else you know, in all animals and all plants. So that sounds like a great algorithm to try and implement on a computer. And the leader of this uh, approach for many years was John Holland. Two more recent uh, people in that area are, are John Koza and Daniel Lipson. And, and John called this genetic algorithm because they are inspired by genetics. And we know roughly how evolution works, so we can implement an evolutionary algorithm that works in the same way. So here's how genetic algorithms work. At any point in time, you have a population of individuals each of which is represented by a genome. Now, in our case, our genome is a bunch of DNA base pairs. In the case of the computer program, it's just a bit string. So you typically start out the genetic algorithm with a bunch of completely random bit strings. And then what you do is each of these encodes a program, so you try each of these individuals at the task that we wanted to solve, whatever it may be. And we get a score, which we call the fitness of the program, by analogy again with evolution. And then the fittest ones get to reproduce. The algorithm literally takes a father genome and the mother genome and produces offspring by crossing them over. And then on top of that, there are mutations, you know, which are just random bits being flipped again, just as in, in natural evolution. And then you have a new uh, population of individuals. And the amazing thing is that if you do this for a few thousand generations, starting from random strings, you often wind up with things that do their job better than any human designer could. Like, for example, the, 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 the evolutionaries, they have amassed a large number of patents from the U.S. Patent Office for things like radios and amplifiers and filters and whatnot that are designed very differently from how electrical engineers do it, but in many cases work better. Let me skip over this. Now, now these days, the evolutionaries are going one step further, and not only are they evolving programs on electronic circuits, they're actually involving real hardware robots. So this here, this spider, is, is a real mechanical spider, it's from Hal Lipson's lab, and it was evolved in the following way. They started with a bunch of parts in computer simulation assembled at random. Once, and, and they applied the genetic algorithm. Once the creatures are working well enough, they actually get 3D printed, so this was 3D printed, and they go out into the world. And you know, and then you measure whatever you want, how fast they run or, or, or how they fly. They have also evolved dragonflies and, and various other creatures. And in each generation, the robots that do best get to program the 3D printer to produce the next generation. And this is how you wind up with this. Now this is exciting and maybe also a little scary. Right? If Terminator ever comes to pass, maybe, maybe this will be happening. I mean, keep the advertising. You know, these little spiders aren't exactly ready to take over the world, but they've come a long way from the soup of parts that they started with. Okay. Now, the, the evolutionaries and the connection is, for all their difference, have something very important in common, which is they both do machine learning that is inspired by biology. Most machine learning researchers are actually somewhat skeptical of this idea, because biology is very random. Right? How do you know that you're learning the optimal way, right? Who knows? It could be anything. Maybe what we should do is, is design learning algorithms from first principles to make sure that they are learning optimally. And the poster children of this approach to learning are, are the Bayesians. And the principle, according to them, from which all learning derives is Bayes' theorem, and hence their name. So some famous Bayesians are David Hackman, Hugo Perl, and, and Mike, Mike Jordan. 
And so, so how do you learn, what, well, first of all, what is Beis Theorem, for those of us not familiar with it, and how do we learn Beis Theorem? Well, Beisians love Beis Theorem so much that there was a Beisian going to start up in London, I believe it was in Wizard, that actually had a big neon sign of Beis Theorem made and hung outside their office for the whole city to see. Uh, so, so there it is. So, so, so how does this work? Well, here's the idea. I start out with a set of hypotheses that I could use to explain the world. Could be a really, really large set of hypotheses. But I'm going to assign a probability to each of those hypotheses of being the true hypothesis, just based on my previous knowledge, my assumptions, etc., etc. This is called the prior probability of the hypothesis. And then I start seeing evidence. And the hypotheses that are consistent with the evidence should become more likely, and the ones that are inconsistent should become less likely. And this, this term, this factor, is called the likelihood. And when you multiply the likelihood and the prior, you get what is called the posterior probability of the hypothesis, which is how much I believe in it after seeing the evidence. And hopefully after I've seen enough evidence, it's clear what the best or the few best hypotheses are. And then there's also you know, this marginal, which you divide by to make sure that the product is up to one, but that's not really that important for our purposes. And essentially, all of vision learning is just based on this idea. And Bayesian learning has been used for all sorts of things, and particularly your, your first self-driving car will probably have what is called a vision network somewhere in it, figuring out you know, where the car is and, and, and how to drive it and whatnot. But one uh, application of vision learning that we are all familiar with and grateful for is spam filters. This was actually David Heckerman's idea, was to apply vision learning to the problem of filtering spam. Back then, you know, things were just done by, you know, by rules. So what is the idea here, is that you have two hypotheses. One is, this email is spam, and the other one, this email is ham, meaning it's, it's actually the email. And the evidence is the contents of the email. So for example, if the email contains the word free in all capitals, that makes it more likely to be spam. If that is followed by the word Viagra, that makes it even more likely to be spam. This is a real example, right? On, on the other hand, if it contains your best friend's name on the signature line, that makes it less likely to be spam. Okay? And this worked extraordinarily well. And these days, you know, people use all sorts of different kinds of machine learning for this, but vision learning is still one of the most widely and, and, and best used approaches to this kind of Finally, uh, the analogizers. So the idea here is that we're going to learn by, by doing analogies between the new situations that we're in and the situations that we've been in before. And probably the best known person in this area is Vladimir Vaknik. He, he invented kernel machines. Another important one is Peter Hart. The first analogy-based algorithm, and, and arguably the first real machine learning algorithm, was the so-called nearest neighbor algorithm. It's a really, really simple algorithm that, that we'll meet you know, uh, just after this. And People in the beginning were very suspicious of it because they didn't see why it would work. And Peter Hart actually proved the first, you know, so-called, you know, representative theorem that says if you give this algorithm enough data, it can learn anything. Before that, there were only statistical algorithms that were very limited in what they could learn. So that was Peter Hart. But maybe, you know, to the rest of the world, the best known analogizer in the world is Douglas Hofstadt, who you may know as the author of Gerald Eshebaugh. His most recent book is 500 pages arguing that all of cognition boils down to analogy. So he really does believe that analogy is the master algorithm. In fact, he coined the term analogy. So, so what is the English Never Album? It's a really simple idea. Let me, and by the way, my PhD here at UCI was to unify analogy-based learning and symbolic learning. So I was, you know, that, that's actually what it was, was taking this and the symbolic learning that we saw before. And, and, and put them together. So, so how does the nearest neighbor algorithm work? Let me introduce it to you by way of a very simple puzzle. Suppose that I give you a map of two countries, Kazakhstan and Megaland, and all I give you on that map is the location of the major cities in Kazakhstan, those are the plus signs, and of the major cities in Megaland, those are the minus signs. Okay? Another question that I ask you is, where is the border between the two countries? And you can't place the border exactly because the cities don't determine the border, but you can roughly guess where it is. A nearest neighbor is no more or no less than a heuristic for solving this problem. And the heuristic that nearest neighbor uses is to say, well, the point on the map is in Kazakhstan if it's closer to a positive city than to any negative one. If its nearest neighbor is a plus sign. 
It's as simple as that. And now, of course, the, the whole point is that you don't use this for maps. You use it, for example, for medical diagnosis. You know no medicine at all. You know, you're impersonating a doctor, you know, like the guy in the, in the Spielberg movie, you know, catch me if you can, right? Steve Abagnale. And then comes a new patient, and you have to diagnose her. So what do you do? If you have the files, right, of the patients on record, you can look for the one with the most similar symptoms and just predict the same diagnosis. And as long as this seems, it actually does better than human doctors at diagnosing most things, based on not very large data sets. So it's a surprisingly powerful thing. And you know, and, and, and kernel machines are, are, are a more sophisticated version of this idea, and that's what people tend to do. And algebra-based learning is one of the most widely researched and widely used kinds of learning. But probably the most, um, the application that we know best and the one that has the greatest economic impact is recommender systems. The, the Amazon recommender system is responsible for a third of its business. And the Netflix recommender system is responsible for three quarters of the movies that people watch. So this is really central to what essentially every e-commerce company does. And what is the idea of a recommender system? Think of Netflix trying to recommend movies to you. In the beginning, people tried to do this, you know, in pre-Netflix days, by looking at properties of the movie, you know, uh, is it action, is it romance, you know, who's the director, who are the actors. But this doesn't work very well because space is a very subtle thing. The real breakthrough was when people decided to use a nearest neighbor type of approach, is to say, in order to predict what movies you like, what I'm going to do is look for people with similar tastes to yours as evinced by the star ratings that they gave different movies. And your nearest neighbor in taste space, as it's sometimes called, could be in Australia. But they just happen to like movies that you like and vice versa. And if your neighbors, you know, all give high ratings to a movie that you haven't seen, well, that's maybe a good reason to recommend it to you. And this very simple idea has turned out to be extraordinarily powerful. Okay, so we've met the five tribes, and we've seen that they each have a problem that they solve better than the others. And they each you know, have an algorithm, a master algorithm, that, that embodies their solution. So the symbolists are the ones that, that really know how to learn composable knowledge, and they do that using inverse deduction. The connectionists know how to solve the credit assignment problem using backdrop. The evolutionaries know how to discover structure using genetic programming, and genetic algorithms in general. Bayesians know how to deal with uncertainty using probabilistic inference, and analogizers know how to reason by similarity using things like kernel machines and nearest neighbor. And in particular, that allows them to learn from much less data than, than, than some of the others. And the more optimistic members of each of these tribes actually believe that they have the master algorithm. So, for example, these days the connectionists have the win in their sales, and some of them say that that prop is all you need. We're just going to apply backdrop to one thing after another and basically solve AI that way. Now, most of us don't believe that that's the case, and if you think about it, it can't be because each of these problems is real, and each of these algorithms only solves one of them. What we really need is one algorithm that simultaneously solves all five problems. That would be the true massa algorithm. So in a way, what we need is, is a little bit like a grand unified theory of machine learning in the same way that the standard model is a grand unified theory of physics, unifying you know, the strong and weak nuclear forces and the electromagnetism and, and so on. Now, how, how would we do that? Like, at first, this sounds like a really um, hard, some, some even have claimed, impossible thing to do, because these algorithms are all so different. But they don't look so different once you realize that they are all made up of the same three basic pieces. In fact, all, essentially all machine learning algorithms are composed of the same three basic pieces. So if we can unify each one of those, then we're basically done. So what are those pieces? The first one is representation. It's this choice of language in which you're going to express what you've learned. Now humans, of course, express things in natural language, and programmers express them in languages like Python and Java and C and whatnot. But in AI, we usually, you know, we typically use things that are more abstract, like things like the first order logic. Essentially, everything that we do in computer science can be expressed in first order logic. But first order logic has a very big problem, which is that it's very black and white. Like things are either true or false. And the world is full of uncertainty and ambiguity. For that, we need probability. Now, the Bayesians have languages that encompass essentially everything we do in probability, things like Bayesian networks, Markov networks, collectively known as graphical models. 
If we can unify those two, then we actually have representation that is good enough for, you know, for, most, for most purposes. And indeed, you know, there's a whole bunch of approaches to doing this. Uh, often they go by the name of probabilistic logics because they combine probability and logic. The most widely used one is something called Markov logic networks that combines Markov networks and first order logic. And the way it works is again very simple. You just take formulas in first order logic and you give them weights. The more you believe a formula, the fewer exceptions it has, the stronger the weight you give it. And then the formulas and the weights together define a problem distribution over the possible states of the world. States in which more formulas are true and those formulas have higher weight are more probable. So that's the representation. The next part is evaluation. Out of all those expressions that you could write, programs, models, etc., how do you choose which are the best ones? Usually the evaluation is a unique combination of how well they fit the data and other desirable properties like simplicity. Luckily here we don't have a lot of work to do because they all are usually equivalent to some form of posterior probability. So you know we already have that coming from Bayesian learning. But more importantly, in general, the evaluation function should actually not be a preset part of the algorithm. This should be something that the user gives to the algorithm. You're the one who knows what the algorithm is supposed to be optimized. If you're a company, maybe it's the return on investment or you know the click-through rate on ads, or if you're a human, maybe it's you know, you have some measure of your happiness, how much you like the movie, etc., etc. But the algorithm should take that and then optimize it. Which brings us to the last part, which is optimization. Optimization is the search process by which the machine learning system finds out of the whole space of hypothesis the one that, that maximizes the objective function. Okay? And here there's a natural combination of ideas from the connectionists and the evolutionaries. Remember that a formula in logic is really a tree of subformulas, right? Connected, you know, by you know, ands and ors and whatnot. So you can naturally use genetic algorithms to discover those formulas, right? It's a very, you know, it's very well suited to that. Then of course the formulas have weights, so you also need to learn the weights. But for that we have backprop. We can learn weights by doing backprop through the tree, through the proof trees to the chains of reasoning that we use to answer the questions like, you know, is Socrates mortal and so on. So with, with, with this, having figured out how you define these three pieces, it, it would seem that we are basically there. Well, are we? Well, some people think we are almost there. I actually don't think so, and I think there's also the majority of you in the field of machine learning is that we are still very far from having solved the machine learning problem. So what are we missing? Well, I think that what we're missing is that, as, you, as you've just seen, the ideas that we have in machine learning are ideas that we've borrowed from various fields, and you know, they were there to be used and adapted. But I think there are some really crucial, important ideas in machine learning that nobody has had yet. And those are the ones that we're missing and need to discover. In fact, another motivation that I had for writing a book was just to get people outside the field interested in it. They're actually more likely to be able to come up with these ideas than you know, the experts that are already thinking along particular tracks. So if you have any good ideas on how to do machine learning, please let me know. So I can publish them. <laughs> so let me finish just by mentioning some of the things that we will be able to do once we have such a universal learning that we are not yet able to do today. Right? Today we can do all sorts of things with machine learning, but there's also some very important things that we can't do yet. Here's one, home robots. We would all like to have a robot that, you know, cooks dinner, does the dishes, makes the beds, etc., etc., but we don't have that. Why is that? Well, first of all, for sure, we can't do it without machine learning. But second of all, a home robot, in the course of a typical day, will run into every one of those five problems multiple times. So until we have an algorithm that can solve all five, we're not really going to have home robots. We can try to assemble, to cobble together solutions, but then, you know, people have tried, you know, a lot, you know, to do this in the past. But then you just run into a wall of complexity and, and you fail. Here's another one. This is often what is called the worldwide brain. The way we use the web today is actually not very satisfying. We type in keywords and we get back some pages that hopefully are relevant to what we want to know. What would be really good to do would be to type in questions and get back answers. 
And all the big tech companies, you know, Google, you know, Microsoft, etc., etc., they have projects to do this. For example, Google's one is called the Knowledge Graph. Right? But doing this requires going to the web and transforming it into a representation that the computer can understand, something like first order logic. But the web is full of contradictions and noise and missing information, so it's going to need to be probabilistic for sure. So again, one by one, we, 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 we come to the realization that we can't have a worldwide brain until we've, we've you know, combined all the, if we have a solution for all of those five problems in one another. Here's another one, maybe the most important one. Curing cancer. As I mentioned already, machine learning algorithms are shockingly good at doing medical diagnosis. Right, you, you, take, you have someone who went to school for many years and did an internship and whatnot, and you know, this is what I was doing in my PhD. I had a bunch of medical data sets in this uh, repository. My algorithm ran on like a thousand examples for 30 seconds, and, and then it was doing, in many cases, diagnosing diabetes or heart disease or whatever, better than those highly trained human doctors. But, we, but so machine learning is very good for these things, you know, things like radiology and pathology and whatnot, but not for curing cancer. Why is cancer different? Cancer is different because cancer is not a single disease. So there's never going to be a single drug that cures cancer. Every, every patient's tumor is different. So the solution, or, or so more and more researchers believe, is a machine learning algorithm that takes in the patient's medical history, the patient's genome, the mutations of the tumor, and predicts for that patient what is the right drug to use and maybe even designs a new drug at the initial using machine learning for that patient, there's also some of the people are doing it. And finally, I mentioned recommended systems, and recommended systems are pervasive in our life today, even in places that are obvious, like for example, Facebook, right? He's using machine learning to pick what posts to show you, and Twitter does the same for tweets and whatnot. But each of these recommended systems is not very powerful because it only knows a small sliver of you. Netflix knows your taste in movies. Uh, Spotify knows your taste in music. What I would really like to have as a consumer is a recommended system that knows me from all the data that I generate, that has a 360 degree view of me. And then because it understands me very well, it can make recommendations much better than if it only had a small piece of me. Now, of course, there's a lot of problems associated with that in terms of gathering the data and privacy and whatnot, but then also you need a learning algorithm that is actually able to turn all that data into an integrated model of you. But I believe that's coming. And then once we have that, these models of us will be even more indispensable to us than our cell phones are today. We won't know how to live our life without these you know, uh, assistants you know, that, that have models of us and that are, and that are constantly helping us. Let me just conclude with a, with a quote from Anish Chopra, who was uh, CTO of the US. If we use all our technology resources, we could actually give people personalized recommendations for every step of your life. Not just for small things like books and movies, but for big things like where to go to college and even who to marry. A third of all marriages in the US today start on the internet. And the matchmakers are machine learning algorithms. Right? In the old days, we had the village matchmaker. The global village, the matchmaker, is a machine learning algorithm. Right? They're actually choosing who is going to you know, meet whom, and, you know, and many of these lead to marriages. So there are children alive today that wouldn't have been born if not for machine learning. But if you ask their parents, you know, why they are going to match them, they have no idea. And, and the truth is, right now, the algorithms are actually not that good precisely because they don't know the people very well, but in the future they will. So, you know, with, with, with all of these things, I think uh, we can use machine learning to make the world a better place and to make us more productive and, and happier. Thank you.